Hey guys, welcome back. Today, we are taking a look at the lore behind all of the new insane, and when I say insane, I mean quite literally insane new Halo 3 and Halo Reach armor that's coming to the MCC as a part of Season 8, the Mythic Season. Now, based on what 343 have said about these armors so far, it seems as though they're kind of a taste of what we can expect from the Fractures armor in Halo Infinite, the non-canon sets of armor. At least, lore-wise, they are, and I'm gonna be honest, I love this stuff. I really hope the non-canon armors in Infinite take this approach and look like this sick as opposed to being like really stupid gimmicky looking cosmetics like what Call of Duty and Fortnite and games like that get as part of their live service. That was one of my biggest concerns with Infinite being a live service game with constantly getting new armor that the armor was just going to start looking silly and stupid but if it starts looking like this then ho oh, ho! We're in for a good time. I'm actually going to make an entire dedicated video on this, I think, later this week, so keep an eye out for that, but let's dive into the MCC armor for now. It's broken down into three distinctive styles. We have the Balos set, which is Ancient Greek, the Blackguard set, which is Gothic Dark Medieval, and Drenger, which is Norse, I think I pronounced that right. And they all seem to be from separate alternate Halo universes, which is so cool. So, the Velos armor seems to come from a universe where ancient Greece prevailed and created their own Spartan program. In this universe, the Spartans are referred to as Chosen, who fight for Lacedaemon, a mythical king of Lasonia, Zeus's son, and the husband of Sparta. They're referred to as demigods and, in some cases, something less than human. In this kind of fractured universe, they've also managed to harness the underworld to travel through slipspace using what they call chthonic slipgates. I think that's how you pronounce it. They've quite literally harnessed hell itself to access slipspace, which is so damn cool. Then, the gothic and dark medieval blackguard armor, my favorite personally, comes from a universe where the colonies are referred to as kingdoms, ruled by powerful lords that have had to unite to face the Covenant Hordes. Now, not only is that so cool, but because of its gothic roots, so much of the armor in this set gives me insane Dark Souls vibes, which, if you know me, I'm a huge fan of Dark Souls and the kind of medieval dark fantasy genre as a whole and the aesthetic that comes from that, so this makes me so happy. And then Drengir, as it sounds, is armor of Norse origin, which is fitting considering the sheer volume of things in like the Halo universe, armor, weapons, vehicles, and equipment that are all given Norse names. However, in this alternate Norse Spartan project universe, this futuristic Norse civilization are facing off against a flood outbreak of which they call the Shapeless Horrors. Again, if that isn't one of the coolest things you've heard in a while, then man, I, <laughs> I don't know what is. I also find it quite interesting that the Norse civilization called them the Shapeless Horrors, and ancient humanity called them the Shaping Sickness. There's a bit of a similar similarity there, but yeah, these like alternate universe things are so cool. So now I've established the kind of backstory for each of them, let's dive into the armor. Firstly, let's take a look at the Belos armor set. Starting off with the helmets, we have the standard Belos helmet. Straight and true, the Chosen are honed and sharpened into a weapon thrust straight into the heart of Lacedaemon's enemies. So, the word Belos refers to the Babylonian god Bel Marduk, the god of creation, water, vegetation, judgment, and magic. But in Greek civilizations, and likely this alternate Greek civilization as well, the term is identified with Zeus, the sky and thunder god, so it kind of translates to that. Next, the Belos Cerberus Helmet. The chosen who guard the Chthonic Slipgates and initiated into their mysteries have no mortal lies, no binding vows, and no doubts. A very fitting description, considering Cerberus was the three-headed hound of the King of the Underworld, Hades, who supposedly guarded the gates of Hell to prevent the dead from leaving. The Belos Karata Helmet. Goring horns are worn by Chosen who abandon reason and the assistance of others. So, Karata stands for horns or antlers in Greek, which <laughs> clearly fits this helmet quite well. The Belos Leontokados Helmet. A rare few chosen live long enough to become transfigured. 
their bodies recast into forms more suitable for eternal war. So, Leon stands for Lion in Greek, and Kardos stands for Heart, so I assume Leonto Kardos kind of roughly stands for Lion Heart? I think it'd fit. The Belos Savino Helmet. Chosen who succumb to the bitterness are blessed and cursed to never walk a path of peace. So, Sophano, I think that's how you pronounce it, was one of the three Gorgon sisters in Greek mythology who were these three evil, terrifying creatures that supposedly lived in the west near the setting sun. Sophano, in particular, means strength. And then lastly for the Belos Helmets, we have the Belos Transverse Helmet. Chosen generals of Lacedaemon's mortal armies bear distinctive crests. So, transverse refers to the crest on top of the helmet, which is actually rumoured to be a sign of rank or nobility, which makes sense given that this helmet is given to chosen generals. Moving on to the shoulders, we have firstly the determined shoulder plate. Each strap has a tale to tell. Then the glorious pauldron, a symbol of ancient glory. The lion guard mantle, a symbol of ancient glory reborn. And then the valorous smoulders blessed by the seers to turn a single fateful blow. Onto the chest pieces now, we have the standard Belos chest piece. Belos hoplite armour is crafted only to achieve victory at any cost, as the chosen who wear it become something other than human. And then the Lokagos chest. Chosen commanders are dispassionate, logical, and feared by their mortal troops. So Lokagos stands for the leader of Lokos, and the Lokos were tactical subunits or warbands of armed men, which to me sounds a little bit like special forces. And then we have the arms. Firstly, the Warriors of Ambrys. There is no finer armour in all of the city states. These arms seem to have Spartan claws. Kind of makes you want to see a Spartan doing the Dragon Claw spec animation. <laughs> if you know, you know. Tell me you don't want to see a Spartan Ninja Turtle or some flood. And then the glorious Vambrys, the finest panoply for Lacedaemon's fiercest warriors. Panoply stands for an impressive collection. For the leg armour, we have firstly the Warrior's Greaves. The Chosen stride the land as demigods, and their judgement is absolute. And then the glorious stride. The Chosen are relentless in war, marching for days before needing rest. And then finally, we have the Belos back accessories. Now, these get kind of crazy, so brace yourselves. Firstly, we have the Lionheart Shield. The Guardians of Lacedaemon either return carrying their shields or reposed upon them. Then, the Seafoam Trident. The arms of the Sea Lords are now prized heirlooms. So, obviously, this is a reference to Poseidon, the Greek god of water and brother of Zeus, and also wielder of a pretty iconic trident. Then, Tegetus Dori, a symbol of martial prowess. So, in Greek, Dori stands for spear, and Tegetus is a Greek mountain range, the name of which is one of the oldest actually ever recorded in Europe, so I'm assuming this is a spear created in the Greek mountain range of Tegetus. And finally, we have the Thessalian Bow, a bow fit for the greatest of archers. By the sounds of it, this is a bow that was created in the region of Thessaly. This could be a reference to Philoctetes, who was apparently a Greek hero who was a well-renowned archer and of whom participated in the Trojan War, and of whom hailed from Thessaly. Oh, and then one last thing that I did forget, we have the Belos Tech Suit, Gen 2 Chainmail. What's old is new again. This is just a light grey coloured tech suit, which is sort of meant to make it look even more like chainmail. Okay, so before we move on to my favourite new set of armour, Blackguard, a quick word from today's sponsor, Audible. With Halo Infinite on the horizon, and <laughs> for real this time, you need to get caught up on your Halo lore, and there is no better way to do that than with Audible. As an Audible member, you get one credit every month to redeem for any title in their premium section to keep forever, which means you can get any book in the Foreigner trilogy that tells the history of Zeta Halo, or Shadows of Reach, what seems to be a sort of pseudo-prequel to Halo Infinite. Or, of course, its sequel, Divine Wind, that releases next month for free to keep forever. And what's more, you can try Audible for 30 days on us just to make sure it's the service for you. 
So, if access to hours upon hours of Halo audiobooks to listen to while working, gaming, working out, or, well, staring at the clock, watching the seconds tick down as you wait for December 8th sounds good to you, then head on over to audible.com slash hiddenxperia, or you can text hiddenxperia to 500-500 to start your free 30-day Audible trial today. That's audible.com slash hiddenxperia, or text hiddenxperia to 500-500 to start your 30-day free Audible trial today and gain access to the biggest repertoire of Halo audiobooks in existence. A repertoire so large that even the wisest foreigners would be jealous. Thank you to Audible for sponsoring the channel, and let's get back to some armor lore. Okay, moving on to my favorite set of armor in Season 8, we have the Blackguard armor. Starting off with the helmet, we have the standard Blackguard helmet. Bitterness and pride alloyed into frozen iron. Then, the Blackguard Tearful Bishop helmet. The faith of the newly converted burns bright enough to consume any truth. This looks pretty similar to a Crusader helmet. I mean, it has a clear religious overtone in its design with the cross as the visor, which, to be honest, is no surprise given the artistic style that it's a part of. Then we have the Blackguard Forsaken Dragon Helmet. There is no fall from Greece, only an awakening to reality. Now, I'm not gonna lie, if the Nameless King was ever given a set of Mjolnir, it'd be the Blackguard Forsaken Dragon. This would fit him so well. The Blackguard Carry On Wind Helmet. Some are born to taste ill winds. Now, obviously, this is a reference to the Plague Doctors, uh, which is quite an iconic design. Uh, a lot of universes seem to implement that into them. I think it looks really, really cool. I also love the hood as well. Fingers crossed we can get hood options for every other helmet, because, I mean, who doesn't want a cool-looking hood, right? <laughs> who doesn't want that? And speaking of hoods, we also have the Blackguard Sorrowful Visage Helmet. Fear can be honed to a sharpness keener than any bleed. This gives me either extreme Skeletor vibes, or <laughs> extreme Dark Souls 3 Dark Wraith vibes. Looks really similar to the Dark Wraith that you find in Farron Keep, I think it was. Uh, I, I love this. I'm, I'm curious to think what Emil would think of this. You've got Emil painting or scratching a skull in his visor, and then you got this dude whose head is literally just a skull, right? <laughs> I'd love to know his thoughts. And finally, for the Blackguard helmets, we have the Blackguard Ashen Crown. It is better to rule in the shadows than serve in the light. Moving on to the shoulders, we firstly have the Knight of Varent shoulders. Renowned as pirates and smugglers, the Blackguard of Varent cast greedy eyes on the land below their Skyborne castle. Varent is an outer colony planet in the regular Halo universe, and I assume it's a kingdom in this kind of splinter universe. Then, the Knight of Venetia shoulder plates. As acquisitive and greedy as any jackal, the merchant thieves of Venetia prowl the outskirts of war, looking for the vulnerable and unwary. So Venetia is another outer colony world, but this one is controlled in the regular Pillar universe by insurrectionists. So perhaps the Knights of Venetia, given that they're merchant thieves, are like the Blackguard universe's own version of insurrectionists? They sound a bit similar. Next, the Knight of Illyria shoulders. The necrotechs and corpse grinders of Illyria labour over mouldy tomes and strange ickers to uncover secrets best left buried. Illyria is also an outer colony world, a third world outer colony in fact, that is impoverished and that suffered from economical collapse due to government mismanagement. Now, necrotechs and corpse grinders, they sound to me like the Blackguard universe's own version of only Section 3 who created the Spartans. And then, the Knight of Madrigal Shoulders. The fallen wardens of Madrigal are siege masters and alchemists of peerless skill and unfathomable cruelty. So, Madrigal is another outer colony world in the regular Halo universe, but it in fact originated from Bungie's Myth the Fallen Lords, which was a game that they made in the mid to late 90s, long before Halo. In that game, Madrigal was a city that fell under siege and had a rather iconic piece of music tied to it. The Siege of Madrigal, that Bungie added to all of their Halo games as a small music easter egg. Now, I'd assume that that's why the description talks about the Fallen Wardens and Siege Masters of Madrigal. You've got Myth, the Fallen Lords, and the Siege of Madrigal. <laughs> 243, whoever wrote this, very, very clever. Moving on to the Blackguard chest pieces, firstly we have the standard Blackguard chest. 
Blackguard Gate is worn by fallen lords and outcast knights who nurse ancient grudges in the tattered edges of civilizations. And then the Margrave Chest. Renegade princelings and once blessed lords of tribute and Venetia are powerful, if unpredictable allies against the Covenant Hordes. Now, once again, Tribute and Venetia are inner and outer colonies respectively in the regular Halo universe, and I'm not gonna lie, I love the idea of each colony having lords rule over them whilst they're also fighting the Covenant. There's something so cool about that kind of clash of the future and the past. I, oh, these fractures are so cool. I'm such a big fan of these. Anyways, moving on to the Blackguard arm pieces. Firstly, we have the Bane Marked Arms. Renegades have access to arts and armor banned in the enlightened Salarian core. And then the Sorrow Marked Arms. The scales must always be balanced. Moving over to the legs, we have Tribute Keep. The Outer Kingdoms are no place for the weak or hopeful. So Tribute, like I said before, is an inner colony, and it's very cool that it's referenced as a kingdom, not a colony. I, yeah, I really like that. And then we have the Far Isle Keep Legs, the thrice damned armorers who dwell in the haunted ruins of Far Isle serve any who pay their tithe of adamantium and bone. So that's very interesting that Far Isle is nothing but haunted ruins, considering in the main canon, Far Isle was a planet where <laughs> arguably one of, if not the worst war crimes in the history of humanity was committed. So in 2492, when the insurrection was at its peak, a civilian revolt broke out on Far Isle, prompting the UNSC to just nuke the entire colony to put a stop to it, which was quite literally a scorched earth plan. So very interesting that in this splinter universe, Far Isle is considered haunted ruins. God, I love this stuff, man. This is so cool. And finally, for the Blackguard armor sets, we have the back accessories, starting out with Law's End. Deeds will always trump words. Then, Everlax Lament. Ambition is your shield. So, interestingly, Everlax was actually a king, a Saracen king. Iron Burst. This maze has shattered the bones of countless heroes and villains. And finally, Sorrow Morn. Its bleed is a thorn of malice. Halo 3 has a katana, it's got shields, it's got a bow, it's got a trident, it's got a maze, and now it's got a longsword as well. And then finally, finally for the black card armor, I keep forgetting the tech suits, we have the Gen 2 Dragon Scale tech suit. The finest scales from the greatest worms. It's just a Gen 2 tech suit with a shiny gold coloring. And so, finally, we have the Drenge armor sets, the Norse ones. Starting out with the helmets, we have the standard Drenge helm. It's gonna be really hard saying that all the time. <laughs> the shapeless horrors strike at the mind just as viciously as they do the body. So apparently the word Drenge was the highest compliment you could give to a man or woman in Old Norse. It pretty much meant badass. It implies reckless courage and a code of fair play. So kind of valiant honor, really, which is kind of cool. Then the Drenge Dvalin helmet. The great beasts who browse among the limbs of the world tree inspire art and song. So Dvalin is a dwarf from Old Norse tales. The name means the dormant one or the one slumbering. He's also one of the four stags of Yggdrasil, which was a large sacred tree that the Norse believed was kind of the center of all existence. Everything that existed kind of surrounded this tree. Yggdrasil was also the project code name for the Mantis and all of its predecessors as well. Then the Drengir Nari helmet. Some tricks and jests are worth any price. So as you can clearly see, this helmet is quite Loki styled, which is fitting considering that Nari, the Norse god of wrongdoing, was a son of Loki who was killed by his brother Vali, who had turned into a wolf. Norse mythology is rather interesting. Then the Drengir Tyra helmet. It is the highest of honors for a law spinner to spark hope in the darkest of nights. Now, is it just me or does this remind anyone else of the helm of Netsenart from RuneScape? Come on, it looks really similar. So uh, Tyra was a female name and literally meant Thunder Warrior. There was also a Danish queen named Tyra who was married to King Gorm the Old, who was in fact the first king of Denmark. Then the Drengir Tia helmet. Loss and sorrow are fuel for the teller of tales. 
So the mention of Loss is very fitting, considering Tyr's history. So Tyr is one of the oldest Norse gods who sacrificed his hand to Fenrir, a gigantic wolf. Fenrir bit Tyr's hand off when he realised the goddess had bound him. Tyr is then, after that, supposedly consumed by Garlamur, the bloodstained guardian of Hell's Gate during the events of Ragnarok, which was essentially this massive war in which many of the gods died, ending their reign of the world, I think, and allowing it to be reborn anew and repopulated by two human survivors. Pretty cool. And the final helmet is the Drengir Valdemar helmet. War demands sacrifice of treasure and blood. The trick is to make sure that it's not yours. So Valdemar is also a Danish king, known as Valdemar the Victorious or Valdemar the Conqueror, who reigned from 1202 to 1241. Moving on to the shoulders, we have Oathbound. A promise made under the World Tree cannot be broken, even in death. Spirebound? Not every poet can be their own master. Fangbound? Passion unleashed in its own special terror. And Scalebound? The dragons trade their stories for memories. For the chests, we have the standard Drengir chest. Skulls who war against the shapeless horrors are given Drengir runeplate, which hardens their minds and sharpens their tongues. And then the Vinra chestplate. The fiercest of skulls are favoured companions of doomed warriors and oath-marked kings. And then we have the arms, starting out with the truth teller spines. The scold spines are either worm teeth or bones of defeated shapeless horrors, depending on the storyteller. And then the accuser's right. No law can bind a scold words and no curse can stay their tongue. For the legs, we firstly have Fast Rider. A good story can only travel as fast as the tale teller. And then the traveler's tale. Even the attire of a scold tells a story. For the back accessories, we have Last Word. Settling arguments, one swing at a time. Oak limb? One cannot throw a cruel barb without expecting some in return. Raven oak? Inspiration can be found in the strangest of places. And Reaver's tooth? A tool of war and peace. And then finally we have the one and only Drengir tech suit, the Gen 2 lattice weave. A pattern of strength. And so, there you have it. There's the lore behind all of the new kind of semi-fractures armors coming to MCC Season 8 Mythic. Let me know what you guys think down below. The whole theming of the fractures in these alternate Halo universes are genuinely something that I didn't know I needed. Like, so much so that I'm, I'm making an entire video about these in the next few days, so look out for that one, because these fractures in these alternate universes have got me so excited. There is so much cool stuff you can do with these. And uh, believe it or not, I've got some ideas. So yeah, keep your eyes open for that video in the next few days. But with all that said, I'm going to round this one out here. I want to give a massive thank you to that wacky flood for becoming a new primordial over on Patreon. And to, and I'm going to say this very slowly because I read this out of my head yesterday and realized what it actually says. Ice. Bank. Mice. Elf for becoming a new iconic one over on Patreon. Man, it's a good job that I read that name a few times before I recorded this video. And uh, also a massive thank you to everybody else who continues to support me over on Patreon as well. And thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.